for the introduction. Uh, I'm also part of the research group here in the university led by uh, Agnes Pente, and I'm also a PhD student in Budapest at the Mohorina University of Art and Design. Uh, and actually my PhD about different types of immersion in live art and in VR, and I'm trying to compare physical and virtual immersive spaces. And uh, I mean, uh, I'm going to partly read, because I have a, uh, I'm going to describe a performance that probably many of you haven't seen, and I would like to discuss maybe after that, so you have a more wider idea. So, um, VR has the promise of total immersion, the promise that they can transport their users into another setting and space by creating a new experiential environment. Artists are also experimenting with their use and how to find the mediums on grammar to tell stories or to create new experiences. In attempting to create new content for VR, one of the main media from which they approach VR is the medium of, of film. This applies to 360 degree videos, which for the full experience is advised to watch with VR head mounted display. But what we are actually really striving for is when we are talking about VR, virtual reality is the VR experience that is a computer rendered image that has an immediate answer to our gestures and that we can also watch through headsets and we are always in a continuous relationship and we can go around the space and find new challenges there. In this presentation, I'm going, I'm going to explore how the possibilities of VR are enhancing but also tightening the possibilities. Uh, especially I'm talking about mixed reality uh, productions and whether can they create a certain kind of immersion. Immersion and getting immersed of course is now a new buzzword mainly because of technological reasons but I think there is also a very interesting taxonomy how we can approach this concept which I'm not going to talk about now but it's about uh, Gordon Kalea and uh, Mary Laurie Ryan who are especially writing about this. Uh, but I'm going to take more now this uh, immersion as a transportation notion and uh, this uh, uh, transportation is not a bodily transportation but a virtual transportation with uh, the help of our senses and uh, many times it can be an abrupt experience when we are taking on the VR, lamp, the VR headset. The medium of performing art with its characteristics as we take to define the, the definition from Erika Fischer-Lichte uh, they, to this belongs the characteristics like bodily co-presence, liveness, and these are already uh, offering a certain interactive experience for the audience. But the medium of performance art merged with the immersive environment that I'm going to talk about can serve really a new ground for liminal experiences. Getting immersed in the virtual reality productions means to create a liminal experience for the audience, which is the key for entering this immersive environment without having a shock. Uh, in this environment, the audience is actually encountering the characteristic of virtual reality and can have a laid-back uh, uh, feeling as well. I'm going to um, uh, uh, say what Oliver Grau said. Actually, I have many problem, problems with uh, this quote because Oliver Grau is taking more uh, examples from fine art and from mural, as you know, and not uh, mainly about uh, liveness. But I think still how he approaches virtual space and how he's talking about this intermediate relationship between images that we are taking natural and images that we are taking artificial is uh, something that also affects the intermediality as how we can see in the performances. Uh, and because uh, Grau talks about the merging of these images uh, that are creating actually the sensations of discrepancies, especially in the audience, uh, sensations and uh, this is what is actually enhancing the intermediate relationship that we encounter nowadays especially in performances. Lars Ellström when discussing intermediality states that intermediality is a result of constructed media borders being trespassed. Indeed there are no media borders given by nature but we need borders to talk about intermediality. However, there are already many studies about how different media and screens can be staged, but what actually VR and the head-mounted display can uh, exclude liveness of theatre, I think, if you don't mind, we can take also your approach of intermediality, and if I misunderstood your approach, you can also tell me about it. Like the, the intermediality in performance is actually a performative intermediality 
and uh, is about uh, staging in the sense of conscious self-presentation to another of media and for which theatre is a hyper medium that provides this perfect state, if I understood correctly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, um, I was actually thinking yesterday night whether to take out this or not because of <laughs> 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 um, So, the process of distinguishing reality from the artwork that I describe and analyze which I will call from now on production, is actually the process of being transported in such a responsive environment is that creates stress and disorientation in the viewer. Uh, as we can see that the intermediate characteristics can actually cause. This disorientation is a liminal experience and by overcoming this disorientation, the viewer can get immersed. The production that I'm going to analyze is Som Nai. I don't know if everyone had, if anyone had seen it in London. And uh, this is an immersive experience per se, as they are defining themselves. And they are using, uh, we can say coherently, the performance art, uh, also mixed with per purposive elements, world building tools, and of course virtual reality experiences. First I would like to show you the trailer of the performance, so when I'm explaining you will have already some images in your memory, and I hope the trailer will work. Oi, oi, oi. I think this computer is again this trailer because I also wanted to put on the video and it was also not working. I'm going to refresh it once. Uh, yes. I slept with someone and now I have it all. fame of the world and uh, yes so what happened in this performance so as the fundamental of world, world building uh, as the fundamentals of world building are requiring to situ to situate immediately the members of the audience in the narrative framework of the space in case of somni the audience became patients of a sleep clinic 
where they can experience the lucid dreaming. The creators use many tools and layers that currently we could consider that is necessary for, for a perfect immersive state. Upon arrival, when we stepped into this uh, two-story, plainly-looking warehouse building, we are greeted by an actor dressed in white who is immediately offering us drinks or mint um, bonbons. And after committing the necessary administrative and log logistic procedures and pre presenting the ticket and uh, using the cloakroom and uh, taking off our shoes, we are uh, invited also to take on a bath gun. When I uh, saw the performance, it was July and it was also in London, 30 degrees, so many people said no to this. Uh, but uh, still, this is how they really want you to have a embody their feeling. A uh, group of audience who could enter at one time in the performance were, consisted of six participants. And uh, immediately we were stepping into a new age cultish looking room, silent music, scents from different candles, and very welcoming woman is initiating a conversation with us, asking about what kind of dreams do we have, and uh, how we could learn here actually to have lucid dreaming. She also tells us the story, which is supposed to be the framework story of the whole co concept about a little boy who loves his mommy very much, his uh, mom passed away, and how he really wants to behave as a good boy because he thinks that his mom is coming back and how he has nightmares because he lost his white handkerchief from his mom and actually this handkerchief is appearing as a tool in the performance one of the six participants is getting that handkerchief and one of the other participants is also uh, lured into a conversation and this is going to be a key issue later how they are actually there are many actors and how they are uh, labeling some of the participants so later they can give them a role and in this way they gave them a sign uh, first, we are entering uh, what, what is very uh, characteristic, what was very characteristic for the performance. We had a lot of, let's say not actors, but orchestrators, as for, for example, like Otilia mentioned, Ben Ford and Janaki's book, and they are talking about trajectories in mixed media performances, but also orchestrators who are not the actors who are dealing with uh, arranging everything in the performance. So let's call them orchestrators, and they were actually really chasing the participants in this building from one experience to the other one. Uh, I would say that like 60% of the experiences were consisted of VR experiences and 40 were consisted of uh, normal, physic normal physical <laughs> experiences. Um, the first encounter was like a step in the encounter where the participants were uh, brought into a very small room, it would, like a round shaped room which, had, which was actually just this high. So we could uh, lay down on tatami looking mattresses and suddenly um, a projector screen was uh, brought upon us, I think there was a picture, and there we could uh, watch uh, was, uh, uh, visuals but like from Vinamp they were very 90s and uh, nothing very special but because the closeness of the projection it was very mesmerizing. After this, immediately another orchestrator is rushing us to another room where we can uh, step on swings. We are also getting a, a head-mounted display. And uh, while we have the narrative framework of like, OK, how is when you want to fly? You, you are actually embodied as a bird. And we are flying with the rest of the birds. And also the swings are arranged according to that. And uh, you, you can actually enhance this experience by swinging. But this is mainly a video, a temp temporal based video. I mean, you can have it for three minutes on, and you are flying a little bit, and then you are going to the next room. And in the next room, which is uh, also there are like other physical encounters, but the, the, because of this rush, you either you can't really contemplate what's around. However, it's very detailed, fully designed all the space. The other VR experience is one of the. I think it's actually what creators are really aiming to create for uh, participants is that uh, you could put on a VR headset and first you were uh, trying out how to balance on the bridge that is very abrupt and you could also see some visuals like they were missing some parts of the bridge and then suddenly uh, you could arrive on a field with mushrooms and with, uh, there were also some frogs and you were actually walking, just going back, <coughs> this is the scene from that, uh, this is an orchestrator and these two are the participants, so you are actually also ha are having a help from the orchestrators, but you are also feeling the other participant, where is he moving? And uh, you could touch, it was a very palpable scene, because it actually looked like this. So uh, you could also touch the mushrooms, you could also touch everything. Uh, 
there was sometimes some technical problems, so I was totally dizzy and to, I was totally sick because it was the whole image was moved and it was not synchronized with my head movements. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem. Uh, sorry. So for you, <laughs> it was fine. I was laughing, but uh, actually this uh, scene also used um, um, the the meaning of isolation. Because in this scene, two of the six participants were actually uh, kidnapped from the rest of the group in a very big silence. Yeah. And uh, one of the orchestrators was rushing us really much into this scene. And he brought us in... Uh, he was actually embodying the young boy who I was mentioning. But he looked really... Uh, they used, the performance used very much these horror aesthetics. Of horror aesthetics with that kids who have a... A room and but everything is empty but there are toys and then he's using the toys also sometimes the, there was very old looking wallpaper and the wallpaper really started to move he also started uh, he also tried to take away from us i had the handkerchief and the other per, uh, person was the other one who were they talking so they exactly knew who we are and uh, they were really um, reenacting the horror movie let's say at the end of the whole scene which was like a uh, it was not really a narrative, it was just like, let's say, a cut scene. They brought us into an escape room looking room, which was also uh, very much using the iconography of those rooms. It was a cellar where you are kidnapped and you are there for days or ages or whatever, and there are like with blood, with blood written in different words. And then suddenly you have a screen, which the screen was using the this pure image. I mean, we know how CCTV looks like. And they were using those images. I mean, we could see actually what's happening outside. We could see ghosts. And uh, we, we were told that we have five minutes to escape, but there was no way of, to, of escaping. And we saw ghosts. And then suddenly we saw the rest of the group coming. And they were actually saving us. <coughs> the last, in the last part, we were uh, brought into an actually sanatorium looking room where we were put on a uh, bed, we also received the VR helmet. There were two orchestrators, I mean, uh, caretakers looking girls, and they were telling us, like, actually, uh, uh, so here we could uh, practice the art of lucid dreaming, and with lucid dreams we can really become, like, strong and powerful. It, it was very much resembling the Scientologist uh, rhetorics how we can use lucid dreaming. And then we also had a scene of uh, falling down and actually, or uh, being lifted up. And actually the beds were also like sensory motorically following us. It was, they were vibrating in different way whether we were falling or not. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the technological tools used in this performance are those that can enhance an immersive experience and can cause the rise of adrenaline level and uh, also they are using the, they are creating a feeling of vertigo or losing the balance and uh, however they are not meaning any direct danger for us. And these are pretty much uh, reminding us of uh, old movies like and, uh, Thomas Gunning the concept of uh, f uh, cinema of attraction when we were actually really surprised of the different genres <coughs> of cutting, <coughs> sorry, of montage and how are we reacting is still that we don't have this uh, literacy of how to watch or still don't really have the literacy how to watch we are or we are just getting there. And Rebecca Rose took Thomas Gunning's concept of uh, cinema of attraction and she's talking about media of attraction. And this media of attraction concept can be really goodly applied for uh, AR, VR or any other mixed reality type of technology. And uh, the main importance in this is that the, these uh, media of attraction tools have like four characteristics. They are participatory always, like VR or AR. I mean, you can, until a certain level, interact with it. They are interdisciplinary. They are seen, and seen in this way means like, you can set, see the edge of the, of the technology. Also like in the old movies case, there was a narrator, there was live music when they were screened in the cinema. Here you can, you, either you have an orchestrator also while having the VR experience, so you can't really move alone, um, or either you have other helps. 
and it's uninstitutionalized. So you don't really get an education of how to create a, the right VR experience, how to create a good AR uh, experience. So it's still under uh, examination. And uh, what I was also very much interested in analyzing this performance was the agency and the level of participation. And uh, as like in every, every immersive theater, uh, immersive theater, you can have the illusion that you can uh, you actually have agency upon the narrative. And there are some performances that are letting you to have more because they are created very um, based on very much on uh, intimacy and uh, I don't really have time. Okay, uh, or on how the actors can actually abruptly um, talk to you about other intimate things. Uh, but in this case it was uh, nothing about this and actually the narrative was just a blunt narrative with no ending, so it was just a framework. So we could consider that uh, there was a good narrative dissonance, this is what we are usually saying about uh, walking simulators, because walking simulators just give you the illusion that you can actually have, actu actually you have agency upon the narrative, but you don't really have it. Um, I also looked at the effects and blocks of effect based on uh, Deleuze and Gattari, like they are talking about blocks of effects. And uh, Shaviro also took, uh, and he, uh, he, oh, sorry, I lost myself. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So Shaviro is actually talking about, I can't talk now because I can't find it in my paper, but that these blocks of effect have a really capitalistic effect on us. On us, we want to have more. We are doing actual labor while watching these uh, uh, very strong experiences. And uh, that actually also these performances, especially this one, it's really uh, gives you this, uh, it uh, makes you aware that you don't only have five or six senses, but actually you have 33 senses, as like we know already. And so it's also using, uh, playing with your inertia feeling. So you can get dizzy because of the VR and you're not really realizing at the time because you're actually sick. So you will just know after that, like, oh, this was a one more sense that I had. Um, and um, yes, so these blocks of effect lie at the very heart of social production, circulation and distribution. They generate subjectivity and they play a crucial role in the valorization of capital. And like uh, this valorization of capital is uh, what I really, I wanted to talk about like how these rooms look like horror and how they could actually equilibrate the virtual reality spaces with the real spaces, like giving you a really strong atmospheric feeling like you are in a horror movie, otherwise they could not really bring you any other feeling, just the thrill which was the most key in this. And here am I. Uh, so the experiencers of these performances are actually running and they are rushed through these performances because they want to have more and more experiences and this is like everything is laid upon and like uh, Catherine Hismister, she's a game uh, theoretician and uh, she's talking about this active uh, attitude and she says like the active gamers are always showing more activation and because uh, the parts of the brain associated with motivation and reward when they were analyzing it uh, was much more uh, higher than those who were just watching possibly a game. And interacting with the game shifted the emotional patterns observed in the player's brain, demonstrating how we human beings per experience particular, how we human beings experience particular rewards and emotions from the act of playing. And we also can have like different kind of social emotions like this, like uh, which is very much characteristic to interactive mediums like uh, guilt or shame. And also Adam Aston is talking about this uh, in terms of immersive theatre and uh, I'm going to end now like uh, what, what really my point was in this, yes. <laughs> this uh, is that um, I'm in the beginning of analysing this performance in depth and how to work with real mixed reality performances and I'm focusing now on space and actually how really you can create spaces for these mixed reality performances like to give meaning to every kind of space and uh, also how to use uh, the first person view, viewpoint for these performances is very important because VR's dramaturgical, main dramaturgical point of view is the first person shooter point of view. So thank you very much and sorry for this experience, just like the performance. <laughs>